Welcome to Vail Mount Votes. This is uh, VCTV's series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with the candidates for the municipal election, for council, for mayor. Uh, we're also speaking with the regional district area H representatives and the school district uh, 57, uh, what do they call it, Robson Valley trustee uh, candidates as well. But here with me today is Sherry G, who is a candidate for council. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, what I'd like to know, uh, before we start getting into the questions, is just to give people a sense of who you are. So maybe you just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I moved to Vail Mount in 2010, and that was because I met my husband, and that's where he lived. So he convinced me to move here and uh, move to this tiny little town. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a bit of a shock for me, because I moved from Kelowna, so... Oh, okay. Yeah, well, small, shock, yeah. <laughs> small town living. Um, took a little while to figure out who everyone was, but I puttered around town uh, working at the coffee shop and the Legion and I did work at the hardware store for a little while and then spent six years working at the bank. Um, got involved with the Canadian Rangers and the Belmont Legion, the Junior Canadian Rangers and most recently the food bank. So through all of that I've met tons of people. There's, I think, more people that live here than we think there are. <laughs> oh, what's your current job? I'm currently working for Robson Valley Community Services, formerly known as Robson Valley Sports Society. Right. Still wrapping my head around yeah. that acronym, but yeah, I'm, I'm the outreach worker, so I help people with all sorts of things. It's, it's a hard job description to put in a nutshell because there's so much mm -hmm. that I can do. Uh, I am also the uh, after hours safe shelter worker, so I'm on call almost 24 hours a day. You are a busy person. I am. <laughs> Here you are running for an office that'll make you even busier. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> you had a couple free hours and you said, hey, how can I fill this? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's just get right into it. I, I uh, We spoke earlier and I mentioned that you have a chance to uh, to give some opening remarks and you said, well, let's just talk and uh, sure. that's fine. But if you uh, if you do at some point change your mind and say, hey, I want to say something, <laughs> just let me know. We'll All give right. you the time there. So that's we're going to jump into it. So these are questions, uh, most of them have been submitted by the viewers. Okay. Uh, first topic is uh, housing, right? It's a very, uh, very important topic at it's this time. It's a big time. housing, right. big issue, yeah. We have a housing shortage here in, in Vermont in the yep. area. Uh, it's affecting home buyers, it's affecting renters, it's affecting seniors, uh, mm -hmm. low-income families, anybody basically looking for the, you know, a place to rent or, or lower income. Some are even calling it a housing crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a potentially uh, serious situation that makes it difficult for not only the local people, but for those who may be coming in here to, to live or work uh, uh, and want to find a place to live. We've, we've heard stories about candidates uh, who have uh, been really good candidates and come and they say, I can't take the job, I can't find a place to live. Yep. Right? And so that's a, a really difficult situation. Um, council, the current council has taken some action on this. The, in the fall of 2016, they, they created the Affordable Housing Committee right. um, to deal with uh, data collection about housing, strategic planning, uh, funding of projects, uh, zoning, bylaws, that type mm -hmm. of thing. And then about six months ago or so, they uh, uh, agreed in principle as a council to donate some land, not sorry, to donate, to uh, set aside some some of their land for an affordable housing project mm -hmm. uh, that will be to be you know placed sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. So they have been doing some work on there. Mm -hmm. um, we have two questions for you about housing. The first yep. one is, what do you believe the role of municipal government should be uh, in addressing the housing issues we have been and uh, will be facing, uh, continue to face. So after you talk about that, we'll talk about housing ideas. And, but what do you think the role of municipal government should be? Well, those are tough questions for me because it's my first time ever applying for any type of position with government, whether it's m municipal or provincial. So mm -hmm. um, the process is something I'm unfamiliar with. But everything that happens in the, in the village is done through our local council. So right. if you want to build a garage in your backyard, you got to get a permit. If you want to build a brand new hospital or a new facility for seniors, everything has to go through the village in one way or another. So having an open mind to new ideas is one thing. Um, if we're being stuck by bylaws, then what can we do to change them? You know, being more flexible in what can we do because everybody knows we have a crisis. Everybody knows we have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. But how exactly do we do that? Right. 
Yeah. Just make it easier for people. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Got to try and take away some of those roadblocks that people run into when they're trying to do something. Okay. Yeah. Great. And the second question is a, a little bit more broader, and that's what do you think council should be doing uh, to deal with the housing issues? Are there some specific actions that they could take as a council um, that you think would help, you know, in addition to kind of taking, you already mentioned, taking away some of the, the impediments, the roadblocks to it? Yeah. Um, one thing I noticed over the years in Valmount is that there are a lot of nonprofits that are working really hard to tackle these issues head on. And I think they really need the support of council to get those projects done. Mm -hmm. um, whatever roadblocks they're running into, we need to find solutions to help them get past that. I don't know what the specific solutions are because I'm not in the office yet. Right. <laughs> but finding out what we can do to support the people that are already out there on the front lines tackling the issue. So maybe as a first step, facilitating some uh, some workshops or some meetings to see meetings. what everybody is doing. Exactly. To try, to, try to avoid duplication. Exactly. Well, and finding out, you know, what what do they need for support? How do we move beyond the concept to actually making something happen? Right. Yeah. Because we have the Senior Citizens Housing Society, mm -hmm. and now we also have VARS, which is mm -hmm. the Affordable Rental Society mm -hmm. that uh, seniors have been doing it since the late 70s. So mm -hmm. they're kind of the experts on that form of housing. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and then VARS as well for low-income housing, and mm -hmm. I think they're doing some student housing there mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Uh, but there is a need for other types of housing, I'm sure. Absolutely. Uh, social housing, for yep. example, and, and yep. First Nations housing, for example. Yeah. Right. Um, seniors is a big, big issue. Um, I don't know how many times I've seen, you know, uh, one of our elders fall, have an injury, they go first thing they're whisked off to McBride to the hospital. If it's more serious than that, they're taken off to Prince George. Right. Um, if at some point they're able to come back out of hospital, meanwhile they may have been in there for weeks and their family are driving back and forth to visit them uh, and they come out, where do they go? Can they go back into their home? Probably not not if they need supported housing, right. right? We do have some home care, but not to the level, there is no supported mm -hmm. seniors housing. Medically supported. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And for me, it just totally breaks my heart to see a senior have to move away. And I could list off quite a few in the last mm -hmm. eight years that have moved away to where there is facilities right. or other family members to take care of them. Often being split from yeah. from spouses that and they've, they've been lived, married to they've, for many years. Yeah, and they've lived here for 40 years and right. then all of a sudden they have to leave everything they know, they leave their community. And they are the lifeblood and they Absolutely. take all those memories <laughs> and, and history with them, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah it's, it's a tragic situation. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about, oh wait a minute, I think there was another question in mm -hmm. there. No, that's it, that's just the two. Okay. Let's move on to a topic um, on economic development. So it's on economic development and economic diversity. So as you know, and as we just discussed, you know, there's been a, uh, quite a uh, surge of, of building of new homes here mm -hmm. uh, and being sold, uh, new businesses uh, opening up in town here. Tourism has been on the rise over the last uh, number of years. But there's still uh, much that can be done in terms of uh, fostering future growth, in mm -hmm. particularly in the business side, in the industrial side, or light industrial side, yep. that type of thing. So a couple of questions here. Do you have some ideas uh, on ec stimulating, eco stimulating economic development in Valmont? And if so, what, what would your ideas be on that? How do you get more, more things happening here in the town from an economic development point of view? That's a tough question. Um, talking to current business owners is a good place to start. Um, you know, when Michael moved here and opened up his brewery, that was huge. It's just a small family coming, opening up a small business, and at first he couldn't afford to employ anyone. Uh, my husband did a lot of free work for him to help him get off the ground, but now he's employed fully and he employs other people in his in the tap room and in the back. Um, so convincing new entrepreneurs that this is a good place to come and open up their business, whether it's a small business or a large business, mm -hmm. is really important. We shouldn't have any empty buildings on Fifth Avenue. We need to fill them. Right. There's yeah. still a few, right? Uh, there are, yeah. <laughs> when I first moved here, I was kind of freaked out a little because I watched the sporting goods clothing store closed. I watched the grocery store closed, countrywide closed, fields closed. And I thought, oh my gosh, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of those buildings have been filled with new businesses. Right. And there is, you know, they are employing people. Um, we can't discount our nonprofits either. They do employ a lot of people. I'm a little bit biased there as I am employed by one of them. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the amount is growing. I've seen it. Right. Yeah. So would you favor an approach which is kind of the old style, old school approach of going out and trying to find a big business like a mill or like a, you know, a, a large employer that employs, you know, a hundred people and, and pays big wages or more smaller businesses that might employ 10 people or 20 people, but there's, there's 20 of them. So, yeah. you know, you end it's, up getting 200 or 400 employees. Yeah. It, it's, it's goes hand in hand with our housing issue. Cause it's great if we get a, a business here that employs a hundred people, but where are they going to live? Mm. Right. So it's, it's kind of hand in hand with our, with our housing issue. Um, I think we need both. I think small business is a, kind of the backbone of the community. Right. Big businesses are great, but sometimes they can be harder on the smaller business person that just wants to you know, run a small family business. Mm -hmm. But I think you can find a balance between both. And that's kind of what the next question is. Mm -hmm. So it's it's about diversity yeah. and diversifying your economy. What do you what's your definition of economic diversity and, and how do you see that kind of unfolding in our community? Again, it's a balance between you've got your nonprofit sector, you've got your small businesses, you've got your bigger industries. Um, that's one thing that Valmont doesn't really have is a large industry. You know, some of the larger, more stable employers, LDM, CN, they 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 only provide jobs to certain groups. But for um, for myself personally, when I came here, I had a difficult time finding a permanent, full-time, professional position. And I, I know a lot of other people are in that same position. So, right. yeah, we definitely need more choices mm -hmm. yeah and and something at a salary that actually will allow you to not only survive but <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah exactly I mean people want to buy houses they want to have benefits and know that they can go to the dentist and get their teeth fixed mm -hmm. and not have to worry about how big the hydro bill is when it comes in the mail <laughs> right. yeah, you know yeah, exactly. there's a lot of challenges don't put that heat on <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah 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 Let's move on to our next topic, which is uh, air quality. So just as a preamble, according to the BC Lung Association's 2017 uh, State of the Air report, they put one out every year, Valmont had the worst measured air quality in all of BC in 2016, uh, nearly double the provincial annual average objective for PM 2.5 emissions and exceeding the provincial baseline of 25 micrograms per cubic meters mm. on 72 of 365 wow. days. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that year, not like this year where we were shrouded in smoke for weeks and in 2017 there were no wildfire uh, smoke mm -hmm. advisories uh, for mm -hmm. 2016 so this is predominantly wood smoke and maybe some sand days some dust days from the uh, from the lake mm -hmm. the question is have you thought about it and do you have a plan for uh, working on this problem of poor health you know poor air quality uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the health problems that it brings and, and if so can you talk a little bit about what what you would recommend to help um, yeah I mean, moving here from the city, one thing I can say is it's nice not to be sucking on car exhaust every day. Mm -hmm. um, the anti-idling laws is, is a good thing, and I've definitely gotten into the habit of just shutting my car off when I go. Even I'm just running into the post office for a couple minutes, mm -hmm. shut your car off, restart it. It's not that big a deal. Um, I think educating people on... It was new to me when I moved here, wood stoves. I'd, nobody in Kelowna burns a wood stove. Is that right? No, you don't have it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it was something I had to learn and I had no idea that there was a difference between green wood and dried wood. <laughs> uh -huh. Of course my husband's on the fire department so I got educated pretty quickly. So they the city girl out of you. Yeah, they did. Yeah, I'm like, what do you mean I have to split firewood? <laughs> <laughs> but it, for a lot of people it's a necessity here, you know, when you can take your pickup truck out into the woods and get a load of firewood mm -hmm. versus having to turn the crank the knob on that baseboard heater and have yeah. your hydro bill tripled. I think it's just education in learn, knowing how to do it properly. Mm -hmm. And I did hear um, something that I was going to look into about uh, there was some type of program about getting people the proper types of wood stoves. 
There's a wood, sh wood stove yes. exchange program yes. that offers a rebate. Uh, I believe it's through the BC yep. Lung Association for mm -hmm. something like 10 to 15 percent on average. But for some people, even that isn't enough. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, we need to really look at that if, if air quality is going to be a big issue, which it is. I mean, my best friend has huge asthma issues. Mm -hmm. There's days when she's scared to leave the house because she can't breathe. Um, then that's something we need to make sure that people are able to afford right. to make sure that they have the proper wood stoves and that they're burning the right kind of fuel in them. I can't tell you how many people I've run into. It, it's got to be, I wish somebody would do a study, but it's, it's almost every fifth person I talk to has mm -hmm. asthma or has developed asthma since they came here or what, and that can't be a coincidence. Yeah, I mean, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. it does make you wonder. Yeah. Yeah. And then there are the, uh, you, talk, you spoke about the uh, uh, anti-idling bylaw, yeah. but yet we we let go unchallenged the, the semi-trailers parked from 6 p.m. to yes. 6 a.m. running their, mm -hmm. their trailers all night long, 12 yep. hours in the evening, and there could mm -hmm. be 20, 30, 40, and if the roads are closed, 100 trucks It adds up. There. Yeah. yeah, it adds up a lot. And uh, in, a, in an inversion situation, that just multiplies. I find that that's a geographic thing here in Valemount because mm -hmm. of the way our valley's built, yeah. that we get those inversions yeah. quite often, yeah. and I've never experienced that before. I grew up in the prairies, so... We never had that issue. Right. Yeah, yeah, it just blows. There's nothing yeah, to stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it goes to the next town. Yeah. Okay, so just in general on air quality, you think mm -hmm. this, this is something that uh, that uh, council should be looking at ways to kind of alleviate the situation? I, yep. I'm, I'm kind of tired of, of being the worst air in BC. <laughs> mm, that's, you yeah, know, we're so beautiful here. Yeah. I look out and I see these gorgeous mountains and a beautiful blue sky, and I think, how can we possibly have the worst air quality in yeah, BC? It's know, it's a shame. And yeah. then uh, you, you see it when it, uh, if you're coming from Tijon, for example, in the wintertime, mm -hmm. you just see that, yeah. that haze hanging over yeah. the town. And yeah. it, it almost looks like we have a mill and we don't have a mill. Exactly, right? yeah. And uh, yeah, it was really bad this summer with the smoke. You couldn't see the mountains and you know, uh, yeah. it was terrible. So. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to uh, our next topic, which is about uh, leadership, uh, communication, and uh, openness, kind of slash transparency. So mm -hmm. um, being a counselor involves uh, having numerous skills, uh, sometimes being a leader, sometimes being a consensus builder, um, effective communications, uh, the ability to present bail mounts issues to other levels of government, mm -hmm. and sometimes when they don't want to hear it, you got to be a little bit forceful about how it's presented, mm -hmm. and a willingness to uh, to listen and to respond to the concerns of bail mount residents in a in a fair, open, and transparent manner, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what everybody, how everybody yeah. wants to communicate. Uh, so we have two topics, uh, two questions on this topic. The first one deals with uh, the position of chief administrative officer, um, and it's couched in this communication side because the. Uh, some people believe it, it is a communication issue that we're having here. And, mm -hmm. uh, the chief administrative officer for the village is an important uh, position. It's the most senior position uh, that isn't, you know, a councillor or mayor. And that that is the uh, the town manager basically or village manager. Mm -hmm. They're responsible for overseeing all the operations of the village. They're responsible for uh, overseeing all the staff of the village mm -hmm. and their council's lone liaison. So they work back and forth just with the uh, with mm -hmm. council in there. In the last four years, we've had seven CAOs or interim CAOs in, mm -hmm. in Valemount, and it leads to hiring costs, it leads to termination costs. I believe there was a fairly expensive study done about one of the CAOs. Mm -hmm. uh, it leads to costs that you can't really put a finger on, but that's mm -hmm. the, the termination cost and the, and the fact you, you bring another person in, it, it destabilizes things until you get that person up to speed again, and then they're gone, you gotta bring somebody else in, so there's always those mm -hmm. periods there in, in between CAOs or interim CAOs that makes it uh, difficult. If you're elected uh, onto council, what would you do or what would you try to do to try to alleviate the, the constant turnover in that position of the, the most key position? Yeah, it's, it's a big issue too. Um, I think someone once said to me that basically the definition of politics is getting along with people. Mm -hmm. And so that's the big thing is just communicating. And you may not agree with somebody, but being able to listen to what they have to say Right. and see it from their perspective that my view is not always 100% the right view and just communicate, communicate, communicate. That's the big thing. 
right. is being able to sit down and talk about something and have a discussion and see things from different perspectives. I mean, if our CAO is our go-between between between our staff and our council, that's a pretty important person Mm -hmm. in the role of everything. So you have to value that person and make sure you understand what, what they're doing, where they're coming from, what they need to do their job, and how to work effectively with them. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really no different, and we've, we've both been in lots of jobs, but it's really mm-hmm. no different than being a manager of a business, right? Absolutely. You're answering to the owner, whoever yep. owns that business, and you're also managing the staff yep. and having to work cooperatively with everybody because mm-hmm. you're all on the same team. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And I think what we've been seeing over the last few years is that we're not all on the same team mm-hmm. municipally, right? Exactly. And that makes it hard to, to move forward yeah. because you start making a plan and then that person leaves. And it's like, okay, let's continue with that plan. And I say, well, that was that person's <laughs> baby, right? And yeah. And now they're gone and I don't have the same passion for that. I, I have a passion over here. Or right. I see something a little different. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, the more of the communication side. So during this council's term, uh, no formal communication policy uh, has been developed. Mm. The town hall meetings, the ones they called community conversations that they used to have, were stopped altogether. Mm. Um, one of the media outlets in Belmont, and it's not VCTV, been having trouble getting any information from the current mayor, who's presumably the spokesperson for, right. for the village of Belmont. Uh, and council really hasn't done anything to try to make it easier for people to communicate and, and to be engaged with them in, in mm-hmm. terms of the, the process, because we're all in this together, as I mm-hmm. just said, right? Uh, for example, this is one of my pet peeves. If you want to speak to council as a delegation, you have to submit a, a, an application in writing, which is yeah. fine. Uh, it has to be in by 12 noon on Thursday. Okay. Yet the agenda doesn't come out till Friday afternoon. So you don't know ahead of time <laughs> <laughs> what's going to be talked about. If you're on the agenda on or the agenda, not. If you should okay. be on the agenda. So if it's a if it's an issue that's been going on, right. uh, like air quality, we had yep. that with, or the Rainbow Crosswalk or something. So if it's if it's something that's been going on for multiple meetings, you don't even know if that's going to be discussed at the next right. meeting, and whether you should be talking about it now or wait two weeks or or what. It's I don't think it's intentional, but it's just one of those stumbling it's, blocks. Yeah, right? it sounds like an administrative right. housekeeping type issue yeah, that yeah, needs to be need looked time at. To do it, but yeah. yeah, I mean, you have to give the person preparing the agenda enough time to receive the information yeah. and com- yeah. compile it and get it out to everybody. Right. But obviously, if it's not working with the current system, then adjustments need to be right. made. Right. Yeah. Another thing that uh, some people find frustrating about uh, working with, with council is the public comments. So mm. if you go to a council meeting, at the very end of the, every council meeting, they allow a public comment section. Okay. And you can talk to anything that's on the that has been discussed on that current agenda right. uh, for two minutes. That's the, that's the limit that they put on. But what people find frustrating is that council may have voted on something earlier in the meeting, mm-hmm. and you don't get to talk about it until after they've already voted at the end of the meeting. So basically you're saying, great job, or you're <laughs> criticizing it one way or the other, but you don't really have any weight. It's not carrying any weight for a decision, unless the decision's being made at the next meeting. Right. But you're not supposed to be able to to comment on something that's at the next meeting. You're only supposed to be able to comment on something at this meeting. Right. So again, it sounds like something administratively right. needs to be readjusted there so that people are able to get their comments in before the vote is cast. They do it in the bride that way. Okay. So they have the uh, approval of the agenda, the approval mm-hmm. of the minutes, and then the next thing is public comments. Right. Right. And then you can speak to something, but only that's on the agenda. And that's fair because otherwise yes. it's a free for all <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> exactly. And you know, the, the thing about it is it gives it gives the council people perhaps some additional information that mm-hmm. they don't have before they go to make a decision on something. Absolutely. You know, so just And I'm not saying there's a, a huge communication problem here. I'm just mm-hmm. saying there's a few little stumbling blocks here that need to be worked through and, and it doesn't seem to be ever fixed. Right. So. And I, I believe in any process there's always room for tweaking it. You know, how can we improve it just a tiny little bit? And small adjustments can make a big difference, right. especially with little things like that, just in the level of community satisfaction with where they're living, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, people want to participate, and, and mm-hmm. if they feel they're not being heard, then they, they tune out, right? Absolutely. And uh, I have seen over the last probably two years a, a pretty significant decline in the number of people attending council meetings. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't think that's that's helpful for anyone. Right? No, we yeah. need, yeah, you need people to be knowing what's going on. 
So that was my question, just yep. so you, we don't think we skipped over it. It was, uh, if elected, what would you do or what, what would you think could be done to improve communication between mayor and council, mm -hmm. between the public and the media that, that engages people rather than... Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about conflict of interest because this is another um, topic that uh, I've heard um, from people is, is an important one and, and this question was sent in about it. Uh, on May the 26th of 2015, so that's in this council's term, village staff presented a policy in number 64 to council which was an enhanced local conflict of interest policy for councils uh, as recommended by BC Solicitor General. The Local Government Management Association of BC and the Union of BC Municipalities uh, believe that enhanced clarifications of conflict of interest guidelines uh, may be necessary in light of a decision, a BC Court of Appeals decision called the Schlenker case, which mm -hmm. is uh, two councillors on Salt Spring Island that were found to be in conflict of interest uh, over a matter that normally wouldn't be covered under the regular conflict of interest guidelines. So they felt that they, they should prepare an enhanced set of guidelines uh, to help in certain situations for councillors and any elected officials, but any councillors. Um, and some of them are different than what's in the community charter, which is what's used right now. There's a community charter and there's a whole set of guidelines in there. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, that's what's being used. Uh, so from the Velma perspective, they did create such a policy. It was called 64. It was narrowly adopted by a three to two vote mm -hmm. with Councillor Reimer and uh, Mayor Townsend opposing. Six months later, they rescinded that policy by a three to one vote with Councillor Salt opposing with the recommendation that the conflict of interest guidelines in the charter, in the community charter, were sufficient. They didn't really explain it, but that's that's what they said. Okay. So the question is, do you believe that interest, conflict of interest guidelines stronger than those contained in the community charter are necessary? And if so, would you support, um, again, putting forth that sort of local, locally written, locally tailored set of uh, more enhanced guidelines of conflict of interest? Um, well, without having read either documents, it's hard to say anything very specific. I will be reading them now that you've mentioned them. Um, the conflict of interest can be a, a, a troubling thing for people, um, especially because we're so small. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's involved with so many different groups, right? So we do have to be really careful that we're not doing something that is going to be either a perceived conflict of interest or an actual conflict of interest. Because right. even perceived conflict of interest can cause harm. Right. If somebody, oh, she only voted that way because her sister owns that or, you right. know, things like that. And that it can create bad feelings that last for a long time. Um, so I do think that we need to look at it and depending on how extreme they are, make sure that they actually fit what we need for our village. Right. Recognizing that we are a small community, we're very tight knit, people are involved in many different organizations, but also making sure that any decisions are being done fairly mm -hmm. and that no one person is being favored over the other or one group is being right. favored over the other, right? So, okay. yeah, I yeah. think that was sort of the intent of that policy, but. Mm -hmm. uh, one never knows what happens with, with things. <laughs> yeah. As, again, part of the communication thing is sometimes things are just not explained, right? You look yeah. at the council agenda and you go, what does that mean? I have no idea, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or some, sometimes they make a decision and they don't really say why. They just vote one way or the other and you're left wondering, what happened there? Yeah. <laughs> what I did think, I miss? I think explaining right. things is really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a large, you know, over my years at the bank, a lot of the times when people were really upset with something, it's because they didn't understand. They right. weren't, it wasn't explained to them. So when you make a decision on something and you put an explanation, this is why I decided it that way, it makes a big difference so people understand where you're coming from. Right, right. And it also gives them an opportunity to say, yeah, but what about this? Mm -hmm. Which can possibly cause you to think a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, there are some people who come to almost every council meeting and there are some who come one time when that thing that's important to them is exactly. Right? Yeah, and, exactly. And they won't really understand the, the process behind it. And yeah. It takes yeah. two seconds to explain something. Exactly. Really, you know? Education is a big thing. You mm -hmm. know, people need to mm -hmm. understand what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, our next topic uh, deals with the Rainbow Crosswalk. Mm -hmm. um, gonna, a little bit of uh, background here. So according to Vancouver's uh, Georgia Strait newspaper, as of July 11th of this year, there are 42 Rainbow Crosswalks in BC. Mm -hmm. uh, on July the 26th of 2016, this council voted against installing a Rainbow Crosswalk, as you might remember, uh, citing, cross, uh, citing cost and safety concerns. Um, 
our research shows that Prince George installed one and they have a four-way rainbow crosswalk in Prince George. Uh, so there's a little more expensive at six, $6,000 and they used a material that uh, adheres for years to the concrete apparently or to the pavement apparently. Uh, Prince Rupert did one at $1,850 just paint and rollers like the traditional way. Mm -hmm. um, you might remember the, the people who brought that forward, the Rainbow Crosswalk Initiative forward, offered to pay for the paint and offered to also do the painting mm -hmm. and do the upkeep of it uh, as needed over the year, but that was uh, not considered or it was considered but rejected. Mm -hmm. um, and on the safety side, a study conducted by the City of Edmonton uh, showed that there are six crosswalks that they have there. Um, the Rainbow Crosswalks have been no safety problems with them uh, whatsoever. Uh, our research on uh, crosswalks across the province shows that there, Vail Mount is only one of three communities in BC to actually have voted against a rainbow crosswalk. Uh, there are some that it hasn't brought, been brought up, but mm -hmm. the, it's us, uh, Merritt, and uh, pa uh, Campbell River right, okay. are the three. Mm -hmm. So the question for you is, uh, given that rainbow crosswalks are seen uh, as a recognition that a community is considered LGBTQ2+, friendly, uh, if elected, would you support uh, the installation of a rainbow crosswalk on a street, a public street somewhere in Valmont? Uh, why or why not? Um, I have talked to people on both sides of that argument. It was very divisive in, was. within the community. Um, and it would be really difficult to just say today, uh, yes. No, because I don't really know. Um, I've talked to people from a faith-based perspective. I've talked to people from a safety perspective. Um, any one problem has so many different lenses looking at it from so many different directions, and you have to take into consideration everybody's views on it. Um, some of the things that were brought up was the location of where it was put in. They didn't want the cobblestones painted. Uh, um, yeah. So perhaps a different location might be more favorable. Um, some people brought up their faith that they would be very uncomfortable with it. And one of the things that that community is asking for is for diversity and feeling accepted. So we have to take everybody's into consideration as well. Um, it's, I don't know if I could say yes or no today on what I would decide. Uh, I am a supporter of diversity. I do think that we need to be inclusive and make everyone feel welcome. Um, does a rainbow crosswalk make a big difference? For some people, yes. For other people, it might make them feel this isn't a safe place for me to live. So it really depends on which way you look at it. That's mm -hmm. a, It's a really tough question to answer. So what would you propose the direction should be to move forward? Should it be revisited? If there are groups that are still looking at wanting to have this and that makes them feel included then yeah I think they could revisit it. They might try looking at it from a different angle. Some communities that may not have been uh, happy with a crosswalk might put up flags mm -hmm. for example. Uh, rainbow banners up and down Fifth Avenue be really pretty. I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right fair enough. Yeah. Uh, another topic which is uh, sure to be somewhat controversial mm. is the cannabis uh, topic. Yes. Uh, cannabis <laughs> recreational use becomes uh, legal in Canada on October 17th, which is yeah. 12 days from now. Yes. <laughs> it could potentially have a major impact here, as it might in, in lots of communities across mm -hmm. Canada. Municipalities uh, everywhere are having trouble mm -hmm. deciding what to do and how to do it and where to do it, uh, etc. So we've got a two-part question for you. The first one's a little bit long. Uh, if elected, would you support and encourage entrepreneurs to uh, start up marijuana retail outlets in the community? Or support only sales through BC um, government cannabis stores? Or are you in favor of banning the, the retail sales of cannabis outright in Vail Mount? Um, I don't think we can ban the retail sales outright because it was made legal nationally. I mean, that's something that the Canadian people obviously want. Um, it, it actually can be done, sorry to interrupt, because yep. uh, they do have to apply for a license. Yes. And the village, because it will be going through the whatever the cannabis, like the, the mm. version of the Liquor Control Board, the yep. Cannabis Control Board, yep. the village does have to uh, hold a public hearing and they do have to sign off on, exactly. on the license. Exactly. So they could, not not on principle, but they could. They could, yes, but I don't water. think that that's what the people of Canada want, mm -hmm. um, and including the people of Ailmount want um, when there's such a big push for 
economic development and businesses. I mean, if we're pushing businesses away because we might not like the flavor of that business for whatever personal reason, then what kind of message does that send to people? Um, I think we have to do it safely. We have to have conversations with everyone in the village about what do they consider to be safe? You know, is it on going to be front and center on Fifth Avenue or is it going to be tucked away somewhere in the commercial area, um, you know, doing it in a safe way so that youth are not impacted by it. Mm -hmm. um, I was spent a lot of time reading uh, BC government's websites on kind of what the guidelines are going to be uh, as far as getting the licenses and where it's going to be allowed to use, what those types of policing, all of that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. all of that has to be taken into consideration. Right. Yeah. There's also the, the topic from a, from a municipal point of view mm -hmm. of usage. Yep. Um, are they going to treat marijuana as a, um, an intoxicant like alcohol and have the same kind of rules? You, for example, you can't walk down the street smoking a joint. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do it in a public place or in a public park mm -hmm. or near schools or mm -hmm. near playgrounds or those types of things, right? So Well, there already are some guidelines from the province of BC about using them in public parks anywhere where children are present. Mm -hmm. uh, myself personally, I don't want to be walking down the, the sidewalk behind somebody that's smoking it. I don't enjoy the smell of it. And it's my personal choice to not use that product. Yeah. Um, it, but I also don't drink a lot, so people do drink alcohol, but they're done under certain guidelines. You right. can't walk down the sidewalk and drink a beer, you can't, no. right? So why should this be treated any differently? Mm -hmm. e even cigarettes are very restricted now as to where you can smoke cigarettes. You can't smoke them in a car with somebody that's under 18. You can't smoke them within a certain distance of a Door. public doorway. So, you know, as long as it's done properly with the proper guidelines in place, um, we'll get through it. <laughs> right. It's coming. It's, it's, it's coming. We can't stop. Yeah, it. No, it's coming. <laughs> we just we, we just have to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. it's tricky, and I think yeah. the, everybody's concerned about it because nothing's really in place, and yet in 12 days, it, it's legal, right? Yeah. And so yeah. You, you know, I can imagine if, if if this was prohibition times and and alcohol was suddenly legal. Yeah. <laughs> what would happen? Free for right? all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope that doesn't yeah. happen, and I, and I hope they find ways to. Uh, to protect the children and protect yeah. our youth, and uh, I, the the good thing I personally see about it is that because we have a, an opioid crisis in Canada and mm -hmm. in the province, it's going to be a safe way for people to get marijuana that that they'll be assured isn't laced with fentanyl or carfentanyl yeah. or something yeah. else, right? Yeah. Well, I've, another part of my background that most people don't know is that when I lived in Kelowna prior to living here, I worked in. Uh, drug and alcohol recovery centers. Okay. So I spent three years working night shift in a women's safe, sh safe shelter, so it was a low barrier where they could still use drugs. And then I spent another uh, one, two, three years working in a men's drug and alcohol recovery center, which was abstinence-based, so absolutely no using. Um, so it does give me a little bit of a different perspective on drug use. And you know, decriminalizing it is, is going to make a big difference for a lot of those folks, mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily mean that we all should start going out and and smoking marijuana because it's legal right, right. it's a personal choice um, I think too that when we're looking at how we're going to roll it out that educational programs for youth is going to be a big thing that's important to me you know there's guidelines and regulations on how it's going to be done but I think educating our youth is right. huge right we got to teach them before they start getting curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And there's a, a second half to this question, mm -hmm. and that's the, the growing side. So according to what I read, uh, people will have the uh, opportunity to have up to four plants for yep. uh, personal use. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you feel should be the laws, if any, on cannabis growing in Belmont? Well, I read that same thing. Um, it didn't specify whether they needed to be indoors or outdoors. Uh, it did specify that they are not to be visible from uh, any public. So, you, you know, you're not supposed to put them in your front window kind of thing where people... Oh, right? Yeah, no, no public... I think I said public views, mm -hmm. I think is what it said. So there is still a level of discretion with it. Um, you know, how is it any different from people growing their own tobacco plants, right, right? right? It is legal. How many people do it? I don't know. <laughs> Not many, right. but 
So I think people have the fears that they've heard uh, in the past about grow ops and you know yeah. the smell of a huge grow op yeah. operation or, yeah. or the mold or the whatever that's created by that or the unsafe situations with power. Well, and whatever. that's that's why I question: Is this indoor? Is it outdoor? Is it you know like my my lilies that I have growing in my front window or my ficus plant? You know, I do have indoor plants; they don't create mold, but okay. you know, I don't think we're going to have a lot of grow up situations because you're only allowed four right, <laughs> so right. hopefully yeah, people yeah. stay within you know. i would just kind of assume that somebody who chooses to smoke marijuana and chooses to grow would probably want to do it indoors because we don't have a good growing season <laughs> well there's <laughs> that too marijuana for yeah six of the yeah year. <laughs> exactly and, and with it being legal hopefully you don't have people breaking into your houses because that was my next right, thought is right. is this going to create um, some type of break and enter issues or policing mm -hmm. issues as mm -hmm. far as you know somebody's got a plant growing in their backyard and it's this tall you know yeah that's a very good question I yeah have no idea the, how much marijuana do you get off of a single plant I have no idea is, is and it enough to I guess it is if you're desperate right because it depends on the size of the plant I guess yeah yeah, yeah. Well, we should consult Cheech and Chong <laughs> <laughs> their expertise uh, last question that's been mm. submitted here is on uh, traffic congestion, which is kind of fun to say here in a small town, <laughs> yeah. and parking issues. And the mm -hmm. question is, uh, what are your thoughts regarding the traffic congestion and parking issues on Karis Drive? Uh, I think there's, they're talking specifically around the new Tim Hortons petrol mm -hmm. uh, yeah. situation there. And also on Main Street around the Swiss Bakery, where people are kind of parking half on the road, half off the road, backing across two lanes of travel mm -hmm. or whatever so what do you think can be done about those well with the swiss bakery i'm not quite sure because they've just become so popular i mean their food great, is great, great plan, and i drive past it every day mm -hmm. uh, you know you see, you see these campers sticking half out into the road and you know you just carry on and try and deal with it um i'm not sure what the answer is there if there's any space for them to build more parking um that's the first time i've heard that specific area brought up mm. um possibly on the other side of the road maybe um it's hard to say yeah. out where the tim hortons area is that one was a huge pet peeve for me and i did uh talk to my husband about it quite a bit um i almost got smushed by a semi Wow. Yeah, trying. he started backing up and didn't see me behind him. And I noticed since they painted the lines on the road and they've put the big no trucks sign up that it is less mm. than it was before. Um, but it's it's ongoing with, especially when the highways close, where do all right. these trucks yeah. park, you know? And if, if it's a truck driver that's never been here before and he pulls in, he goes, oh, Tim Hortons. And then he's at a dead end road. What does he right. do, yeah. right? Yeah. So. And they've got. I mean, there's there's uh, the Nordley's home mm -hmm. down there. There's, yep. there's the hotel down there. Yep. You know, so exactly. I, I remember a few times where they actually blocked all the lanes. You couldn't you couldn't even drive down there. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And that was before they part painted the lines. The line when they painted the lines, it made a big difference because yeah. people could see. Okay, this is actually a lane. I can't just park my truck here and mm -hmm. stop. Is this yeah. maybe something you think that the village could consult with the Ministry of Transportation about and try to come up with a better, I don't think anybody counted on, there's just so many ways to get in and out of yep. that area and yep. there's pedestrians crossing and it's... it's Especially a, when it's an unfamiliar path. intersection. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing when we go through it every day and we kind of know where to look out for, but if you're, a tourist, if you're yeah. a tourist and you've never been here and you don't realize that there could be somebody coming from there or there or there or there, you know, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I have one question that's uh, written for you, specifically for uh, for each of the candidates, and this okay. is this is yours. So earlier this year, you and your husband uh, recently went through a life-changing experience. Um, could you please explain what that was and why it prompted you to let your name stand for elective office? Okay. You make me cry. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, my husband developed what's called endocarditis. It's a severe infection in the lining of the heart, and his lungs started filling up with fluid and so we had to ambulance him to Prince George. When he got to Prince George and they did the blood cultures when they found out that he had this infection, it was also in his spine. Um, they call that osteomyelitis. So when, the, when you get an infection in your blood, it travels through your whole body mm. and it can actually land in certain spots and what they call vegetate, so it starts to grow and he developed a vegetation on the mitral valve of his heart. They ambulanced him by air to St. Paul's 
and and this is part of why I'm very strong in wanting to advocate for medical services because it was a very difficult situation for me as a supporting person. I had to drive to Prince George and then drive to Vancouver, mm. not knowing if my husband was still alive or if he survived the transport or... Terrible. It was. Um, during that drive, I got news that my father had a cardiac arrest and was in hospital. Um, I arrived in Vancouver at two in the morning on the weekend of the Juno Awards. <laughs> oh, right. No hotel room whatsoever. Oh, no. um, slept in my car. He were, he, we were in hospital for a total of 21 days. He had, on Easter weekend, uh, a big downturn in his lung capacity. He could, he's, wasn't able to breathe mm -hmm. and they decided they needed to do emergency surgery. The, he was scheduled for the following Wednesday, but he wasn't going to make it that long. So they wheeled him into surgery to replace the mitral valve because the bacteria had destroyed it. Um, after the surgery, he was on life support for four days. And during those four days, I didn't know if he'd had a stroke or if he'd had uh, oxygen deprivation to his brain because mm. he did have a cardiac arrest on the way to the operating room. So four minutes without oxygen. <laughs> Thankfully he woke up, he was still there, um, and then the long road to recovery starts mm. in the healing process. He'll probably have to uh, have the valve replaced again in seven to ten years. Uh, when we got back home, um, we found out that the community had done a fundraising dinner for us and raised a lot of money and it was the most amazing feeling. I mean, how do you say thank you to a whole town for supporting you? Um, they had a spaghetti dinner made by Jeannie, she's an amazing cook, mm -hmm. and a silent auction with things donated from all over, right. amazing prizes, so I was told. But it was so humbling and just awe-inspiring and you know I'm a firm believer in paying things forward rather than paying it back and that's what made me decide I need to do more. Um, that's what made me decide to go work for uh, Robson Valley Community Services, <laughs> No Longer Support Society, um, because it was more in lines with me being able to help, help people and give back to the community. So it was really it was a life-altering experience. Um, when I got home, I, also, I forgot to mention my father did pass away. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, so I wasn't able to go home and deal with that. But when I got home to Valemount, I kind of fell apart. And I experienced a lot of symptoms very similar to PTSD. Um, I can imagine with all you went through. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I found, though, that we have good supports in place for mental health support. So I went to the clinic, talked to my doctor, got some counseling through our mental health worker, and it helped a lot. You know, she got me back on track and focused in a new direction. And, you know, so that's good. But I'd like to see that expanded because I did have to wait a few days before I could get in to see her. Yeah. It'd be nice to be able to, okay, yeah, immediate. Right, right. But, you know, when you only have one mental health worker and you have how many clients, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so ultimately that uh, experience uh, and counsel that's kind of led you to that path for community service, for yep. public service? Yep, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, someone had asked my husband to run and I said, why did they ask you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm way smarter. <laughs> He's not going to watch this, right? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's great. yeah. Well, you know, I, I've heard lots of people describe how they went into politics, and I've never heard a story quite like yours before. So it's, it's very inspiring. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, you. hopefully it goes well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for sitting through all these questions for okay. us. Um, again, I'm going to make sure that you have the same opportunity. If you want to say something, uh, you have up to three minutes to do a, kind of a closing statement if you want to. If you don't want to, that's fine as well. Um, well, I didn't prepare a statement, but, you know, I did just tell you my story 
and I would like to take this opportunity just to say thank you to everybody in Valemount. I've been trying to, you know, thank people individually, but I really don't know who all was there. I was told that they were over capacity and turning people away at the door. I recall, yeah. <laughs> and I've never really had a chance to just say thank you to everybody, you know, for supporting me like that. Well, you, you and Clayton are loved in this community. And that's and such that's, a wonderful feeling. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to tell people now, please uh, not tell them, but just to encourage them to get out and make sure you vote because you heard a story like that about someone who's entering public service. Don't you feel you have an obligation to get out there and, and cast a ballot? And it's important in a town like ours. Uh, we have uh, one or two votes can make a difference. So if you decide you're not going to vote, you may not see your candidate get elected. So please get out there and vote. There's two opportunities to vote for mayor and council. Uh, the first will be at the advanced polls and that is uh, Wednesday, October the 10th and that will be at the Village of Vailmont offices at 735 Cranberry Lake Road from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and if you can't make it for that you have the general voting day which is Saturday, October the 20th and that will be the same hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and that will be at the usual place we vote and that is over at uh, the Vailmont Community Hall at 101 Gorse Street. So please make sure you get in one of those two and tell your friends get out there and vote it's important right people have absolutely. died to give us this freedom so absolutely we can vote, yes uh, to make it jerry thank you very much thank for you. coming in thank and you for having being, me being so uh, kind and honest with us and uh, best of luck in the campaign thank you thank you